Hello, Cornerstone Chapel, and those joining us for our ongoing journey through the book of Deuteronomy. This is a series that's entitled Together Forever. And the book of Deuteronomy stands as an invitation for all who have interest in understanding not just the Old Testament and the story that it tells, but for those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ and become a part of the family of God, it's an invitation to understand what this journey to bring redemption has looked like and why does God do the things that he does and why does he say the things that are recorded that he says in our Bibles today. So with that in mind, I want to encourage you, this is week number 20 and we're going to be looking at Deuteronomy chapter 15 verses 1 through 23. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up and turn there and follow along. This is a verse by verse journey. Uh, and also wherever you're watching this, you'll find a copy of the study notes available as well as the going deeper questions to reflect and process uh, what it is that we're going through in this uh, in this chapter because it's not simply a study to fill our head with information but it's an opportunity for us to see and to know and to experience God in ways that transforms us to become more like him. That said, let's go ahead and open up in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, our God, I thank you so much for this time to gather with friends and family around your word. Father, I pray that your spirit fills our heart, Father, for you, as with Israel, are not a God who desires a circumcision of the flesh, but of the heart. And I pray, Lord, that your spirit would lead us into all truth, to see you and to know you and to allow you to work through us, Father. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, I've divided this 15th chapter up in four points. Uh, the first one, verses 1 through 6, God invites us to become a part of what he is doing. Um, chapter 15, verses 7 through 11, God wants us to live with open hands. What does that mean? What does that look like? Verses 12 through 18, God wants us to bless those that are in our care, in our sphere of ministerial influence. And then finally, verses 19 through 23, we're giving to the Lord. What does that mean? What does that look like to have God central in our lives? Uh, to get to that conclusion, we need to begin in the first six verses. Chapter 15, verses 1 through 6. At the end of every seven years, you shall grant a release. Now, this is the manner of the release. Every creditor shall release what he has lent to his neighbor. He shall not exact it of his neighbor, his brother, because the Lord's release has been proclaimed. Now, of a foreigner, you may exact it, but whatever of yours is with your brother, your hand shall release. <clears throat> but there will be no poor among you, for the Lord will bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance to possess. If only you will strictly obey the voice of the Lord your God, be careful, being careful, to do all this that I command you today. For the Lord your God will bless you as he has promised you, and you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. You shall rule over many nations, but they shall not rule over you. And see, what I want us to understand, when we look at the Old Testament, especially the law, we have this tendency to feel like it's this weight of just rules after rules to complicate and make life not fun. But we have to remember what God is doing with the nation of Israel. He is showing the world what it looks like to be in relationship with him. What it, he's, he's inviting Israel through this law to understand what they were created to be and to be doing. They were created as image bearers of him to walk with him in relationship, to receive his love and worship him, as well as allowing that love to overflow in how they did life with each other and how they managed the creation that they had been put in charge of. So with this, let's not look at this as a list of do this and don't do that, but rather an invitation that God is extending to us to become a part of what it is that he's doing. Well, what is he doing? He is making Israel a blessing for all the nations. That blessing is a restored relationship with him. Now, these are not rules. Well, let me, let me go through this a little bit here. The law continues now here to shape the very lives of the nation of Israel in re ways that reflect his heart. Up to this point in time, God had been showing Israel some of the do's and some of the don'ts and some of the, the, the effects. If we choose to obey God, this is the blessing that he can pour into us. If we walk away from God, he cannot bless sin. And that's what he's trying to get us to understand. It, it's not that God's love changes for us. If we choose to disobey him and we choose to go in directions that lead us to not only into sin, but bringing out sinful behavior, God cannot bless that because it's not who he is. He is 
holy, full of mercy, grace, and love. He cannot bless sin because it is not a part of who he is. God is pulling us out of sin in order to be with him. We are not pulling God in sin to become a part of us. Let me say this again. God is pulling us out of sin to be like him. We are not pulling God into sin to be like us. And it's important that we orient our, ourselves around this reality. Now, what is God doing here? The law is an invitation to know the created intention God had with us, has with us, to know him and be filled with his love, to share that love with each other as we manage a creation he put us in charge over. Now, the law would produce the fruit of works because of the atonement. And that's what we're going to look at at the end of this chapter. But we need to understand at the beginning, God is not expecting obedience to the law uh, to accomplish a relationship between he and them. He's not saying, hey, if you do this, I'm going to love you. All that God is commanding Israel to do, all that he's inviting them to participate in, is based on the foundation of atonement, that he has provided a covering for their sin. So this law is bringing out who they are. God is inviting them to, to act like the children that they are. Obedience to the law should be the natural fruit that's coming out of who we are because we are a part of God's family. And, and so God is providing this blueprint for the nation of Israel, for the communities that they will make up, that there would be no poor among them. That's God's intention. This blueprint, if you follow the design that I'm giving you, there will not be any poor among you. If you obeyed him, he would supply all of their need. Now, this sab sabbatical year was talked about a little bit in Exodus and Leve Leviticus, but it certainly was not drawn out into the detail that God is giving Israel through Moses right now. So understand, what is a sabbatical year? That means every seventh year was to be a universal release of all debt. It is regardless of the amount and regardless of the length of the term. So imagine what it would look like to do business in the nation of Israel. If you're coming up to the sabbatical year, and this is week number, year number six, and next year is the universal forgiveness, you probably wouldn't be extending a lot of loans that would, see it, that would require a life beyond one year to recoup, right? And so it doesn't matter the length. You could open up um, and, and take out a mortgage in year number six. In year number seven, you're forgiven. Now, is that fair for somebody who took out the mortgage in year number one and paid all these consistent years? That's not looking at what God is trying to get us to understand, what God is trying to get us to see. He doesn't want to think us to, to orient our mind in how can I get the most from my neighbors. God is orienting us to see how can I give the most to my neighbor. See, and that's what's important. God is trying to, we naturally want to get the most out of what we invest, right? We want to get the most out of our neighbor. In God's kingdom, in God's family, he wants to orient us to see our neighbors as how can I give the most to my neighbors? And this is counter to, to how we are as sinners, but it's with the spirit of God is working to bring the fruit of out of us. Now he continues, one of the things that's interesting here is if they're a foreigner, verse 3, may exact, you may exact uh, the, the length of the term of the debt. So this doesn't, this universal forgiveness, it does not apply to foreigners. What does this mean? Is God being partial? Is he showing injustice? Foreigners are those who travel through Israel, who may be displaced in Israel, and do not receive the invitation to be a part of Israel. And what God is showing the world is that these blessings are for those who are in the family. You cannot live in the land and expect to yoke the benefits of a relationship with God without having a relationship with God. That's what God is trying to show the world. You cannot have the blessings of being in my family if you are not a part of my family. And so these are gradual invitations of love that, hey, look, I desire to pour blessing into you, but you need to become a part of my family so I can do that. If you're not a part of my family, I can't be your dad. I can't be your father. I can't nurture you up in my household. And so this was, again, a reminder that to have what God is offering, you need to be in relationship with him. Now it would continue, and it says God's intention with this blueprint that he's giving Israel, if you follow this, you will have no poor among you. So God is inviting Israel to be a part of what he's doing. Well, what happened? 
because Israel surely had poor throughout the entire journey of their experience in the Old Testament, as well as even in the New Testament. And here we are today, even after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. How do we still have the poor among us if what God is saying here is true? Very good question. And let's look at verses 7 through 11 as we look at now God wants us to live with open hands. If any among you, one of your brothers, should become poor, any of your towns within your land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against your poor brother, but you shall <coughs> excuse me, open your hand to him and lend him sufficient for his need, whatever it may be. Now take care, lest there be an unworthy thought in your heart, and you say the seventh year, the year of release is near, and your eye looks grudgingly on the poor brother, and you give him nothing, and, and he cries out to the Lord against you, and you will be guilty of sin. You shall give him freely, and your heart shall not be grudging when you give it to him, because for this the Lord your God will bless you in all the work of your hand and in all that you undertake. For there will never cease to be poor in the land. What? Listen to this. There will never cease to be poor in the land. Therefore, I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother and the needy and the poor in your, in your land. So what is God doing here? Despite the blueprint for relief to the poor, the reality was there would always be poor among them. And understand the usage of poor here. Poor, it can be a, a, uh, an ongoing station or it can be a season. An ongoing station or a season. Now, even though there was a, this was a national covenant between God and the entire nation of Israel, it's important to understand the Bible makes clear that not everybody who was in Israel was a part of Israel. What I mean by this, they may have the males have been circumcised in the flesh, but they weren't circumcised in the heart. And believe it or not, even in the early days of the nation stepping into the land of promise, there were those who simply did not want anything to do with God, who did not live according. They would go to church, they would do the bells and the whistles, they would go through the formality of it, but their hearts were not in it. And so they were milking the benefit of God without being in relationship with God. And so God would continue to, to invite a reality of, hey, look, this is where your heart's at. How would God invite that heart to come out? By the poor. Now, the poor would be a variety, become poorer in a variety of reasons. One, they get sick. They can't go out in the fields. They cannot tend the vineyards. Some ailment comes upon them and they fall behind on their bills. Now they become poor. They're not able to pay. And so they have to sell the things that they have um, and they find themselves in a state of poverty, poor. And it doesn't necessarily mean destitute living, living uh, out in the fields somewhere. It can be not able to afford bread and provide for their families, pay taxes, um, and, and bring the offerings that are required uh, for, for the Levitical priest and the, the upkeep of the tabernacle many reasons. They can become ill. They can have sinful behaviors. Maybe instead of using the money that they got from the harvest to buy more seed or to buy what they need, they went and they bought a ton of wine and just had a drunken weekend. Um, they were indulgent. Maybe they bought more than what they needed to selfishly satisfy things that they have. They mismanaged. Um, it can go on and on. The reasons that somebody finds themselves in a state of poverty, whether uh, a great length of time or a very short of period of time. God isn't inviting us to see what's going on behind the scenes, causing a person to be poor. What God is inviting us is to participate with him in response to the poor. See, if we live with our hands closed, we're living with the heart of what can I get from my neighbor? God wants us to live like this. What can I give to my neighbor? See, when we live open-handed, that goes twofold. One, we receive from God and we're able to receive it. See, if we're like this, you, you can't catch things like this with a closed hand, right? God wants us to live open hand. And why? So we can receive from him in order to give. Allow him to give through us. God demonstrates his love, right? To us through Jesus Christ. We demonstrate God's love to those who are poor. As they're poor, they're crying out. And in this case, if they have needs that go unmet and they cry out to God for mercy, for grace, God is always hearing and God is always answering through Israel, through us, if we bring it into our context. If we have those who are needing and they're praying and they're crying out to God, it means that we're not listening to God and we're not being his answer to them. And see, God counts this as sin. If we look to our neighbor who has need and we turn a blind eye, that to God is sin. Why? Because that is not what God would do. Sin is everything that God is not. Sinful behavior is behavior that God would not choose to think, do, or model. 
turning a blind eye to the suffering, turning a blind eye to the hungry, turning a blind and deaf or an intentional, uh, this intentional heart that, okay, they've got, it's like a, a, a person has become a prune. You can still squeeze it and get a little juice out of it before it's a raisin, right? And, and God says that heart, that attitude, that's not the way he is. And that's not who we are anymore in covenant relationship with him. And so God wants us to live open-handed so that we receive from him in order to allow him to give through us. It's not about what we can get from our neighbor. It's about how we can give to our neighbor. Again, that's the key theme of, of this 15th chapter. Jesus himself would say about the poor, listen to this. In Matthew chapter 26, um, verses 6 through 13. Now, when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster flask of every, very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head, and he reclined at the table. His disciples saw it. They were indignant, and they said, Why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble this woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. And pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for the burial. Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. See, Jesus even affirmed that you're constantly going to have the poor among you. And, and it continues. And it's a way for us to bring out our heart. Now in that question, that in Jesus' circumstance, we know that uh, that came from Judas. And he had little to no concern about that money being given to the poor. But he had control of the bag and his heart had abandoned Jesus and his mission a long time ago. Judas represents those in Israel who are a part of Israel without being a part of Israel. Judas represents those who come and have a form of godliness but deny the transforming power of God's love in their lives. Judas represents those who I dare say go to church every Sunday but yet have no relationship with God. They just want the blessings from God. And so how do we tell? How do you respond to the poor? Are you like this or are you like this? Even if it means it would hurt or cost us. Now let's move on to the third point. We've looked at how God invites us to become a part of what he is doing. We look at how God wants us to live with open hands. Now God wants us to bless those in our care, verses 12 through 18. Now if your brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, is sold to you and, and he shall serve you six years, seventh year, you shall let him go free from you. And when you let him go free from you, you shall not let him go empty-handed. You shall furnish him liberally out of your flock, out of your threshing floor, out of your wine press. As the Lord your God has blessed you, you shall give it to him. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore, I command you this day, if he says to you, I will not go out from you because he loves you and your household, since he is well off with you, then you shall take an all and put it through his ear in the door, and he shall be your slave forever, and your female slave, you shall do the same. It shall not seem hard to you when you let him go from you, for at half the cost of a hired worker he has served you six years. So Lord your God will bless you in all that you do. Now what's happening right here? God wants us. See, again, he's inviting us to the invitation to work off debt. If you have somebody who finds themselves in circumstances in this in this context where they're poor and they need to take out a loan, they need to become indebted to somebody, they could come and they could live with and serve somebody that they were borrowing from in order to pay back. Now, why did God design it like this? It's not to instill a slave culture. God is reminding them that they were slaves in Egypt and he brings that up. Why? Because that was hell on earth. Nobody wanted to, to, to live like that. God delivered them. So he's, he brings that up here so that they understand context. Look, they're coming as your brothers and as your sisters to work in your family in the blessing that I had poured into you for such a time as this so that they can do what? They can heal if they were wounded, if they were hurt, if they were, uh, for whatever reasons that brought them into becoming impoverished or where they needed to take this loan out, this time of serving out, um, it's a time for them to heal under your care, under your love, and under the opportunity to work. If it's misbehavior, if it's not dealing with money well, if it's not learning to balance and, and, and have a budget, it was an opportunity for them to not only heal, but it was an opportunity them for the, them to learn to not repeat the process. See, God invited this opportunity for people to join families, to work, to satisfy debts that they have, to meet needs that they have. And so what would happen in a situation like this 
in our context, if something, if I was very, uh, I mishandled money and I didn't budget my money well, and I found that I couldn't feed my family and we lost our home, we lost our property. And what would happen? I could go live with an uncle. I could go live with a neighbor and I can say, Hey, look, I, I, I messed up and I cannot afford, I'm in a state of poverty right now. Can I work for food? Can we have that little bungalow in the back? And so I would go to my neighbor and I would live with them and I would tend the fields and I would work with whoever owns the land and the property, I would work with their family, I would work with their servants, and I would learn in the, the value of healthy rhythms so that when the year of release comes, that seventh year, and I am free of my debt, I have now become resourced, not just with new behavior. God wants the person who I was working for to give me extra so that I can start new and build on that. See, God is always about rehabilitating, about redeeming, and about restoring. And we see that here in this passage. And, and what God is saying here too is that sometimes if you're doing this well, people are going to fall in love with you and want to be a part of your family. They don't want to leave and they want to become rooted with you. And that's a wonderful blessing. That should always be the mindset. Are we loving to where people want to be a part of who we are as a family? There's so much gospel truth that's nestled in this that we just miss when we look at it as simply a list of do's and don't rules. You know, this is the heart of God and it's never changed. It's never changed. So God wants us to bless those that are in our care. The invitation to work off a of debt was a way to help heal and rehabilitate neighbors. It was a way to become the hands and feet of God to love into others well. And finally, how do we how do we know that this is not we're not doing this to earn God's love? God's not saying, "Hey, I want you to do this and then I will love you." No, it is who we are. And that's bring, what brings us to this final portion verses 19 through 23, giving to the Lord. It says, "Now all the firstborn males that are born of your herd and flock, you shall dedicate to the Lord your God. You shall do no work with the firstborn of your herd, nor shear the firstborn of your flock. You shall eat it you and your household before the Lord your God year by year at the place where the Lord will choose." But if it has a blemish, if it is lame or blind or has any serious blemish, whatever, you shall not sacrifice it to the Lord your God. You shall eat it within your towns. The unclean and the clean alike may eat it as though it were a gazelle or a deer. Only you shall not eat its blood. You shall pour it out on the ground like water. So what's happening here? At the foundation of who they are with God is the atonement. And Raising the sacrificial lambs year after year after year was a way, it's very similar to us at Cornerstone Chapel. We observe communion every week. Why do we do this? Because it reminds us central to who we are with God and central to who we are with each other is the sacrificial atonement of God's son, Jesus Christ. His death, his burial, his resurrection allows his blood to wash our sin away, allowing us to become a part of God's family. So when we read the Bible and we read the invitations of what our life with God should look like, we do this work because it's who we are. We're a part of God's family now. We're not governed by sin. We're not in that kingdom of darkness. We're in the kingdom of light. We're, we're God's sons and daughters. And this is what life with him looks like. And see, God was reminding Israel that it's the atonement that brings them into the family of God, not their works. Their works come out. The obedience to law is meant to come from who they are with God through the sacrifice, through the atonement of the of the 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 blood. And when we have that foundation and we remember who we are, we are going to be a part of what God is doing. We are going to look to our neighbors not to gain from them, but to give to them. Our heart is going to be inclined with open hands to receive from God in order to bless others and pursue how we can bless others. God, We are going to allow God to work through us to either in our times of poverty, learn from those through humility, the wisdom that's needed to bring and grow into the life abundant that God has intentioned for us, or if we are blessed and we are on that end of experience that we can turn and look to those who are suffering and step into their circumstances and do life with them in a way that allows God to heal them through us and to resource and rehabilitate and bless them through us, all for the glory of Jesus Christ. Why? Because this is who God is. And this is through Jesus Christ, the fulfillment of atonement, 
who we are now and forever. And so this, ladies and gentlemen, is Deuteronomy chapter 15, and by far one of my most favorite chapters, if you can't tell, in the whole book of Deuteronomy. So I pray that this has blessed you and encouraged you. Make sure to go through the going deeper questions. And I just want to close in a time of prayer. Father, our God, thank you so much. This is not something that's meant to be a burden or just fill our heads. Father, you continue in Christ to invite us to be a part of what you're doing. Not to earn your love, but it's because of who we are. Father, I pray that you help us to live with open hands, looking to our neighbors, not to what we can gain from them, but what we can give to them, receiving from you to give to them. And Father, I pray that you would help us to be blessed or to bless those, Father, that are there are in need, uh, the poor that are always among us. May we always have a heart that, that seeks out to be your hands and your feet, to not only uh, bring healing, but to, to rehabilitation uh, that's needed, Father. And we just, we pray, Lord, that we would always remember that we were slaves to sin. And if it wasn't for Jesus Christ, we would not be a part of your family. So these are not rules to make our life complicated or hard, but Father, it is an invitation for us to see who we are as you, uh, as your children, who we are because of who you are, Father. And I pray that you bless us with this reality every moment of every day. May our minds be transformed to think and our hearts transformed to beat to the rhythm of all that you are. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining me. Until next week, this has been Deuteronomy, week 20, chapter 15. Take care. God bless. And always remember, I love you. The Lord loves you. And he is always one prayer away. And if you need any encouragement from him to hear his voice, open up his word. And he is always there through his spirit to speak into you wherever you are at. Take care. God bless. We'll